Thank you very much, but uh, actually we have only one hour and I really don't want to miss any minute because I think it's very exciting that uh, uh, this uh, one hour which, are, which is uh, ahead of us. So dear uh, committee members and followers, uh, dear, uh, dear all, uh, I really would like to welcome you at uh, our meeting, the Parliamentary Network Women uh, Free from Violence and of the PACE Committee on Equality and on Discrimination. And I'm really very glad to, uh, to have the opportunity to see uh, so many of you in person, and you know that we had elections in Hungary, so that's why I could not be here physically, even there were some possibilities to be uh, together. And of course I was re-elected, so that's why I can be here, by the way. And of course uh, we are going to discuss here a topic which is uh, pretty important, the role of men and boys on stopping uh, gender-based uh, violence in order to contribute to the preparation of the report uh, by my very, very great uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Ms. Petra Steinen for, uh, for, for the committee. And of course, parliamentarians from, uh, from this uh, assembly, we will have the possibility, uh, of course, to ask uh, questions while other interested parties and the general public uh, will be following us online. And I think it's a great opportunity that more can be with us uh, uh, in, in, in the sphere. And I really would like to remind our great members and uh, our guest speakers, who I also would like to welcome uh, online uh, to request the floor. You should click on the request to speak, the Monde de Parole button, and of course your name uh, will then appear on the list of, uh, of speakers. Uh, then you can see if uh, the click on the so-called request list icon uh, on the right uh, of your screen. Uh, when I give you the floor, uh, you must then manually activate uh, your microphone and uh, camera. I think we have time to learn it uh, after the last, uh, I would say, two years. And of course, when you take the floor, I ask you uh, to change the language selection uh, at the bottom uh, left uh, of the screen uh, to, to floor. Otherwise, you, you, you listen the language of origin. Let's put it in this way. And the documents uh, for the meeting uh, can be found under the documents icon. So it's abs absolutely it's very, very practical. So thanks for all the colleagues who did these techniques before. Uh, and this is on the right hand side of your uh, screen. I hope that I'm clear enough and uh, welcome, welcoming the newcomers as well. And actually, uh, let's start uh, uh, for adopting uh, uh, the agenda. So if you could adopt the agenda, just put your right or left hand as you wish. I don't mind. Uh, just to make a little gym in the afternoon because I think it's really important. So, uh, good. And then uh, uh, I understand that uh, uh, you are, re or they are all happy, so then there are no comments, so uh, that is the case, then we are happy to be the adoption. And of course, um, uh, it's absolutely important that uh, uh, if you request the floor, that the same procedures, you have the, your microphone and camera if you are not here, and of course, uh, you know that you could have uh, the, the floor. And uh, I think that is, uh, that is uh, uh, really like that. And uh, of course, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, the agenda of this afternoon is adopted, so, and there is no changes, so then I just would like to uh, tell uh, that you have in your files the minutes of the meeting of the network that was held on December uh, 2021, uh, and of course, my question is, uh, is any of you has any comment uh, of these minutes? I would be surprised, but by the way, anything can happen. This is not the case. So uh, can we there approve the minutes of the last meeting then? That is absolutely fantastic. And of course, now I'm happy to inform you that we are, yes? Oh. Unfortunately, when you are chairing, you can see this amazing public who is here with us. But let me tell you that I feel absolutely privileged that uh, our sec first woman Secretary General of the Assembly, uh, Destina, is with us. So if we could have a clapping hands or doing like this, you know, just to show that uh, this is so good that you are here. I don't know, would you like to make any comments uh, before we start? Because, of course, uh, it's always a pleasure when, when uh, you are here. And, uh, and if you allow me, let me thank uh, her that uh, she helped us to create this PACE Women, uh, 
uh, which is really a great uh, opportunity for us, but we need to find the best structure. Uh, I just would like to remind you, because don't forget that we have an EGA committee, and of course we need to find out how can we have the best function. So, dear Secretary General, it's a privilege that you are here. Thank you very much. Every time I come to your meetings, uh, Zita always surprises me, so I have uh, to, to improvise a few words. No, but it, I thank you for raising the, the, the PACE, uh, uh, Women at PACE uh, platform, just to, to say that uh, we had already a meeting of the Bureau uh, of this informal group, and uh, now it is in very good hands. Uh, women from all political groups and uh, one non-registered lady also in, in this bureau. And I can assure you there is so much complementarity and for sure no duplication uh, with what you are doing. Uh, I'm just coming from the lunch with the President of the Italian Republic, uh, Mr. Mattarella, and during the lunch he uh, raised the issue of sexual violence. Uh, and uh, the support the Italian presidency is given to, to this issue. So I look forward to, to being with you and follow your discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I think it's a absolutely g great news that uh, you brought us. And now we should start uh, the role of men and the uh, voice uh, in stopping uh, uh, gender-based uh, violence. And of course, uh, I think it's absolutely important, and of course, it's a great pleasure uh, now to give the floor uh, to Ms. Petra Stinen, who is the reporter, uh, and uh, of course, the report of the topic uh, for a couple of uh, introductory remarks. So, if I should say, uh, Petra, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Zita, and uh, wonderful to have Despina here, and Maria, and many, many other people I know are great allies in putting, um, not only putting the Istanbul Convention high on our agendas, but also to look for articles and for inspiration. And the article 2012.4 is about the role of men and boys. Now, yesterday evening, my Twitter is exploding, yesterday evening on Dutch television, a very famous sports commentator, Mr. Derksen, said smilingly how he put a candle in the vagina of a woman who was subconscious years ago, and he just laughed about it. He said it was a, sin it was a useful error. The men around him in the sports program were laughing. Now people are saying this is rape. And it reminds me of the saying of uh, Margaret Atwood. Men are afraid that me women laugh at them, but women are afraid that men kill them. And I know when we talk about role of men and boys, we're not talking of all men, but all of the women in this room know that we don't know who are the men who are not doing these things all the time when we're walking in the streets, when we're in the office. Of course, not all men are perpetrators, but we need to look at why do men do this in 2022 in Ukraine, in Russia, in our offices, laughing at TV studios. Why is it that men don't accept a no? But men can be agents of change, and I think this is what this article is about. They can speak up, and they can really be allies in working against these harmful masculinities. One of the speakers we will listen to is uh, Ivan Jablonka. I have the Dutch version here of his book, Men Who Are Just, <laughs> or Who Are Just, Looking for New Forms of Masculinity. Liz Plank, another lady, has written a book about, uh, an academic has written a book about mindful masculinity, and we need men to set norms for these kind of masculinities. We need to look at good practices. Um, and there are worldwide, there are a number of movements, and we have two speakers of these movements. We have Promundo and Men Engage, and they really show us how we can engage men and boys in convicting or finding ways to, to convict each other, to convince each other that gender equality can only be reached by involving all genders. Um, and of course, when I say men, we have to look at men in all their diversities be it age, education, background, race, uh, sexual orientation. Um, and, and I think we can really benefit from looking at all of these diversities. I'm going to conclude, Madam Chair, but a few more uh, comments. 
Um, Mr. Jablonka has written a new book, Un Garçon Comme Vous et Moi, and I haven't read it yet, but if it's as good as this book, um, I will buy it and read it this weekend, because in this he makes a fantastic analysis on how education gives a gender privilege to men in our societies and how this has been internalized in our cultures. He's talking also in this book, the Zam Just, about how can we fight patriarchy. Patriarchy is detrimental to the well-being of man as well. Um, and I would like to point out one of my close allies, Bob van Pereren, who is in the Dutch delegation. And we are politically, I would say, we're at really different angles of the political spectrum. But on this issue involving men and boys in combating gender-based violence, I say we are our allies, so I'm very happy that you're with us here, and I'm happy for all the men in this room who are with us here, and I hope we find inspiration, Zita, to involve our male colleagues, because I've noticed that very often when we have a meeting of the gender equality group, or when there is an issue, even women at pace, I mean, maybe we should involve men at a certain moment also in this movement, that men think gender-based violence is not about them. It's a women's issue. And I hope that this report will enable us, all of us, to involve our male colleagues to put stopping gender-based violence higher on the political agenda. Because for me, there's one way to stop gender-based violence. It's for men to stop doing it. And I will leave it to this because we have three wonderful speakers waiting for us. Huh? Thank you. Thank you well. Graag gedaan. So. I am very, very pleased, and uh, uh, I think she gave us some homework uh, to study these books, uh, but I think it's pretty important because uh, I definitely understand that uh, we need to get that knowledge uh, as well. So I have the pleasure uh, now uh, uh, introducing uh, a great human being, uh, Ms. Giovanna Lauro, PhD Vice President of Programs and Research uh, at Promundo uh, US. You have worked over 15 years, am I right, 15 years uh, on the promotion of sexual reproductive health and rights and the prevention of gender-based violence through gender transformative uh, uh, approaches, including a focus on transforming uh, masculinity, masculinity by engaging uh, boys and men in partnership with uh, women and girls and individuals of all uh, gender identities. Uh, would you be so kind uh, to present us uh, the work of uh, Promundo? Uh, and please uh, let us know why we should involve men uh, and boys to stop uh, gender-based violence. The floor is yours, and uh, she has four minutes. Uh, yeah? OK, so you have maximum eight minutes, and I, we are really looking forward, and of course I'm sure that we have a pretty good attendance of, uh, of uh, the committee that uh, we also have uh, some questions. Thank you very much. So you are warm welcome. Thank you so much, Mrs. Gormai, and thanks uh, to the network and the committee for the opportunity to be here with you today virtually. Um, also, thank you very much to Mrs. Steenen because the introductory remarks actually were perfect to set the stage to my contribution, which really will focus on uh, what are the root causes of violence that we're seeing perpetrated by men, and also what can we do about it. But before I get into that, I wanted to just establish maybe some basic principles uh, that we should all keep in mind when we talk about engaging men and boys in the prevention of gender-based violence. Because there are many ways in which we can go about that. And I think in this room, we all agree uh, that it's important to do so from a feminist center perspective. It's important to do so by working with women's rights organization by listening to their inputs, by uh, letting them hold us accountable as we go about engaging men and boys. And it's not an either or, uh, it's not about funding women's rights organization or working with men and boys. We need to do both. We need to increase the funding from women's rights organization, the work around issues of gender-based violence response and prevention, and we need to get better at uh, including uh, transformative ways to really question the ways in which power dynamics uh, uh, contribute to 
um, gender-based violence. Uh, as we do that, it's particularly important given the backlash on women's rights that we're seeing across the world and of course across Europe. Um, I'm, a, I'm an Italian, I'm a fellow European, so I was uh, delighted to hear uh, the comment by the Secretary General about, about President Mattarella. And as we do all this, it's important to remember that as Mrs. Steenen said, of course, um, most violence is perpetrated by men, but not all men are violent. And so as we call out men, as we call out those who perpetrate violence, those who don't act when they see a violent act being committed, we also need to call them in. And we need to call in those who are already embodying nonviolent, caring, nurturing way of living, and we need to amplify their voice. So as we go now, maybe a little bit onto why, uh, the, the, the why question that Ms. Sistinen shared, I'm gonna uh, share some slides, just three, three slides. So it's gonna be very, uh, very quick. And now you should uh, see them on your screen because the evidence that I'm gonna share with you today comes for instance, from a large uh, body of data that Promundo and other partners have been collecting over the past 10 years, which is called Images the International Men and Gender Equality Survey, which is the most comprehensive survey about men's and, and women's attitudes and behaviors around several aspects of gender equality, including violence, that is intimate partner violence, violence against children, uh, sexual harassment, sexual exploitation, etc. Here you can see an overview of the countries in which images has been conducted so far. And one important data that I wanted to share with you all today is that across almost all of these countries, we see one constant association. That is that men who have witnessed violence against their own mother when they were children are 2.5 times more likely to perpetrate intimate partner violence when they become adults. This is a staggering figure, 2.5 times more likely. And it gets even more staggering if we think that globally, one out of three men has witnessed violence against their own mothers. So this really tells us about the importance of breaking the intergenerational cycle of violence, not only by responding to violence currently happening, but really investing in prevention. Another data that I wanted to share with you today concerns the effect of gender inequality on men themselves. As uh, uh, Petra Stinen was saying, gender equality is good for men themselves. And we need to remind them of this. For instance, across all of these countries, we see that men who hold more gender inequitable attitudes are more likely to engage in suicidal ideation, are more likely to engage in uh, binge drinking, drug abuse. They're more likely to experience traffic accidents. So again, Gender equality is good for everybody, including men. And what can we do about it? And that's where I wanted to share with you a couple of ideas, a couple of current initiatives that Promundo and others are leading globally, including in Europe. One concrete thing that we know is that we need to start early, as early as possible, because boys start very early understanding and learning that they should not share their vulnerability, that that should not show any fear. And so that's why, along with the Caring Foundation and Plan International, we have launched a new global initiative called the Global Boyhood Initiative to work with boys starting as early as four year old and to work with their caregivers, their parents, their teachers, their coaches, and change the ways in which they're being raised. We've got activities actually, both research and new tools being created for teachers going on in Italy, in France and in the UK, and those will be publicly available later this year for those of you interested in learning more about this. Of course, we also need to look at the virtual spaces in which boys are shaping uh, their, uh, their humanity. And so this is an example on this slide of a research that we recently conducted with the Gina Davis Foundation on how um, TV spaces, for instance, media spaces impact the ways in which we raise our boys. And similar research we conducted also on online gaming. And again, all of this is available on our website. The last slide, because I'm conscious of time, I just wanted to say that, of course, as we work with boys, it's equally important to work with adult men 
and not all hope is lost, even when adult men have already developed deeply ingrained um, beliefs and norms around gender equality. But evidence tells us that once men become fathers, that's a one crucial entry point where actually most men are willing to revisit some of their deeply held beliefs. And that's why, along with partners around the world, we have created the Men Care Campaign, which is now active in 50 countries, including some in Europe, such as the Netherlands, for instance, Portugal, where we work with men, both as individuals, but also with health systems, with health workers, with companies, uh, and with government to really uh, promote a more equitable approach to caregiving. Because evidence tells us that boys who have engaged equitable fathers grow up to model those behaviors. And girls who have that kind of father are less likely to engage in abusive relationships when they grow up. All of this um, to say that I am delighted to be here today. I'm concluding here my remarks and I leave the floor to my colleagues from Europe who will have also much more to say on to the next uh, um, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Grazie mille. Uh, I can tell you a personal story, very short. Um, when uh, I had uh, my first child, we had an opportunity. Uh, I needed to go back to work, and uh, my son was nine uh, months old. And actually, uh, there was three months uh, with his father, and of course, that was not the tradition in Hungary. And I can tell you that uh, as uh, my husband spent uh, a very precious time of that age uh, with our son, it could really felt uh, during the whole life cycle. And uh, this is also true uh, uh, because it, it, it could not be the case with my second son. So that's why I can really tell that the fine tune it's physically to be together. So that's why I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely uh, crucial. And I think uh, the children need the fathers too, by the way, or, or the partners too, let's, uh, let's put properly uh, on the table. So thank you very, very much. I, I really, really appreciate. And now uh, our second uh, great contributor of today. I really would like to give the floor to Ms. Teresa Schweiger. Am I right, Petra? Austrian member and coordinator of Men Engage Europe, a regional network within the Global Alliance Men Engage. Lovely to see you. Uh, could you tell us more about Men Engage Europe and, and of course, to share with us uh, your uh, good uh, practices and, of course, showing uh, your, uh, your great uh, involvement of uh, men and boys uh, against uh, gender-based violence. So the floor is yours and, and you have uh, also seven to max eight minutes. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. What is the role of men and boys in stopping gender-based violence? Um, I'm the co-coordinator of the European network Men Engage Europe, but we are part of a global network called Men Engage Global Alliance. What makes us unique? Currently, we have um, 88 organizations across Europe um, and 12 individual members in our network. We have members from 33 European countries, from Russia to Portugal and from Turkey to Finland. So we try to um, engage men and boys through various um, different levels. And my colleague mentioned some of these initiatives uh, before. I want to point out some further points we have. So first of all, we also uh, provide a feminist, pro-feminist platform for networking, for capacity building and advocacy on issues relating to working with men and boys on gender equality. As it was pointed out, this is key since we want to work hand in hand with women and girls and people of all genders. And we want to do this work in order to stop gender-based violence and fight for gender equality by changing power relations. The network works across borders and cultures in Europe. So we are very aware of the different local situations, the different situations boys and men um, face in their daily lives. But we are also united by this common goal to engage boys and men um, in stopping gender-based violence, but it also in the greater um, goal of uh, a system change uh, for a gender equal society. 
So we do this um, on various levels. First of all, we want to give um, uh, spaces for men and boys to reflect on their own well-being. Uh, a lot of our members are grassroots organizations uh, working with men and boys directly in workshop settings, in schools, at universities, on all levels. So this is a very important part of our work. And the basis for this work is the insight that current gender stereotypes and gender stereotyping contribute vastly to limiting and damaging norms of gender. So basically, we need to look at what are the current gender stereotypes that um, might enable gender-based violence. Currently, and this is also uh, good news, we see a broader engagement of men and boys in stopping violence, while at the same time, we have to be aware that it is not enough. And of course, in some parts, as it was mentioned, we also witness a backlash when it comes to engagement and countering gender-based violence. However, if we as individuals and as societies want to stop gender-based violence, and it was said before, we need to engage men and boys and teach them how to be part of the solution. They need to be there. So how do we do this? First, and this is very important also for our work, we have to differentiate between working with boys or young, me young men and men, older people, and also between different groups of men. And we have to tailor our approaches according to the target group and their needs, as well as the needs of girls and women in their surroundings in order to be accountable. When it comes to working with boys, and I've been doing this for over 10 years, we also must be aware not to label them or put them in another box again, while at the same time we have to be aware or make them aware of male privileges and structural power relations. The so-called man box, a box which includes stereotypical labels and requests such as be a real man or boys don't cry, is one of the greatest barriers to behavioral change as such assumptions limit both perception and performance of individual boys. We should also should be aware that boys who do not fit into this box, boys that are non-violent and gentle get our attention and are not overlooked. When working with men, we have different approaches, such as working with perpetrators, but also prevention. It was mentioned before, prevention is really key. Our aim is to call all men to action. The motto is do not accept gender-based violence if you witness it, become an ally. And you can do this by starting in your own surroundings. Such an approach needs time and space to self-reflect and sometimes also to be brave. This is an important message we give the men we work with. Sometimes it is not easy to stand up uh, for women and for uh, gender justice. However, as a network, we're aware that working on the individual level is only one piece of the puzzle. Structures must change too to facilitate the change of individuals. As Men Engage Europe, we are building inclusive collaborations from local to global and regional levels and develop joint actions in partnership with and accountability to women's rights, gender and other social justice movements. One local level, on local levels, our members are involved in advocacy. I want to give an exa example from Poland, um, who share the care, who recently published a guide for working parents and employees, equal at home, equal at work. This is a collection of expert articles and good practices for employers concerning building parental equality in the workplace. I want to conclude my statement with following. Working with boys and men needs to call them to action, both through individual work, such as workshop settings, educational programs, as well as through structural measures, such as paid leave for fathers. We can support them to see girls in women's point of views, to listen to their stories and be empathetic for these struggles in order to achieve this change. 
Furthermore, we need men in power or role models to act as role models. This is very important, especially when working with uh, younger boys. They need role models from the media, from the political sphere. Lip service is not enough. However, as a network, we firmly believe that change is possible, but it cannot be done alone. Thank you for your attention. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, we have uh, two. We have two excellent women with uh, with a long uh, experience, and I think it's absolutely important that they, they share with us. And now we have a third uh, speaker. Uh, we also have the honor of uh, having with us online uh, Mr. Ivan Yablonka, uh, professor of the University at uh, Sorbonne Paris Nord. A member of the University Institute of uh, France, and of course, uh, you wrote uh, a history of masculinity, masculinity uh, from patriarchy to gender justice, in which you discuss the culture and norms that shape ideas uh, of the male self. One of, uh, okay, uh, you know the noises on the right, so hope that we can deal with. Uh, and one of the arguments uh, is that men are trapped in a gender dimension. In your work, you reflect on uh, masculinity. And being a man, uh, just a man, uh, un homme juste, comme dit le français, uh, means. And of course, we look forward uh, hearing your views on uh, masculinity and uh, the role of men and boys in stopping uh, gender-based violence. So the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. I don't know if you can uh, hear me. Uh, yes, but we cannot see you, which is the joy 50%. But uh, okay, good. Is it okay this way? Okay. We get 100%. So uh, I'm extremely okay. So I'm extremely honored and uh, happy to speak at the Council of Europe and uh, to share my uh, research uh, with you. And I would like to express my uh, warmest uh, thanks to uh, Mrs. Gourmay, uh, Mrs. Eng Blom, and uh, Mrs. Steenen, and uh, all the members of the Committee on Equality and uh, Non-Discrimination who uh, invited me uh, so kindly. So uh, I will begin uh, my talk with an uh, observation that seems uh, fundamental to me. Uh, men have been at the forefront of every battle except for uh, gender equality. Uh, they took part in so many revolutions, but they scorned the feminist uh, revolution. And I do think that uh, this has to change. So uh, my book is a reflection on how men can change for the better. And I uh, wanted to uh, launch a collective debate about uh, masculinities. What masculinities do we want and uh, do we need? And this uh, led me to a quite sensitive uh, issue. What is a good guy? I mean, in a, uh, in this uh, informal speaking. What is a good guy as far as uh, gender is concerned? What is a good partner? What is a good father, a good manager, a good physician, teacher, urban planner, um, MP, uh, as far as uh, gender is concerned? So uh, to put it in other terms, how can we uh, reconcile uh, masculinity and uh, justice? Of course, uh, it's not easy to intervene uh, in such a debate as a man. But uh, I intervene as a man to uh, rethink uh, the masculine for men's use. Uh, because uh, it seems obvious to me that uh, gender equality implies a relationship with two terms. So yes, men in this relationship, men can help rethinking this uh, relationship. So I'm speaking about 
gender equality, but I'm addressing men and not uh, women. My conviction is that uh, as men, we have the responsibility to take part in this huge social shift since the Me Too movement uh, broke out. Uh, I believe in uh, an old word, uh, universalism. The fact that you can engage in other struggles than yours. What's wrong with that? Well, besides, I'm also the father of uh, three daughters and uh, this debate uh, suddenly became very concrete. So for me, uh, equality is no longer a theoretical word, but uh, a daily struggle. Uh, and I would like to change the world uh, for, the th for the sake of my, um, of my daughters. Obviously, um, it is important for a man to be uh, respectful, kind, gentle, gentle, but I, I don't think it's the main thing. Uh, what is required of men is that they be just. And um, there are uh, three aspects in this uh, cause, uh, gender justice, from the, the point of view of a man. First of all, to question oneself and to be sensitive to relations of uh, power. Uh, and be able to uh, uh, ask oneself uh, questions such as where does my power come from or why do I refuse equality? The second aspect is uh, to experience equality in practice. Uh, for example, uh, in sharing powers or in uh, sharing the sacred, I'm thinking of uh, religions. And the third aspect is uh, connected to uh, taking side in favor of women's rights uh, by inventing uh, what I would call new solidarities. For example, by refusing male complicity, uh, such as uh, mis misogy mis misogynist jokes in uh, you know, uh, the locker room. So uh, this is what I call a gender new deal. Uh, with the capacity of implementing an equal division of powers, uh, responsibilities, and uh, equalities. Uh, by uh, saying that, I uh, don't want to blame or attack or vilify men or make them feel bad. Um, the risk is less of being an alpha male than an archaic man shaped by uh, patriarchy or overwhelmed uh, by the march of uh, society. So I think that it's up to men to catch up with a world that has uh, changed. So of course, the crux of the debate is how to pursue men to change, how to get them uh, involved. Um, my arguments is uh, are about uh, men's happiness. Uh, I think that we must escape from what I call the gender prison, the model of a compulsory virility or hyper masculinity that is nothing but male alienation. Secondly, I think that uh, we uh, as men must acknowledge our vulnerability. We have the right to try to break down, to consult a therapist, uh, and we can accept our insecurity instead of turning it into violence. And uh, finally, lastly, we have the opportunity to lead a healthy life by taking care of our loved ones, especially our uh, uh, children. So um, for a man, uh, as you can uh, see, to call for uh, gender justice is to fight against oneself. So uh, this is why I suggested the concept of counter masculinity, which is, first of all, an examination of conscious. Um, and I attempted to undo the upbringing that we received and, that, and the, the reflexes that we acquired. Uh, that is to say, our gender uh, ideology. 
I would like to conclude uh, by saying a quick word about the Me Too movement. It's not only about uh, sexual seduction, sex, and uh, violence. The Me Too movement uh, challenged a whole system of uh, domination. And uh, I was uh, struck by the silence of men. Uh, but uh, I think that the times are ripe uh, since masculinity is going through a troubled period. So um, this is why I wanted to intervene as a man rather than uh, remaining uh, silent. So thank you for your attention and I would be happy to uh, address uh, your questions. Yes, so thank you very, very much. So now I was informed that uh, Chris Stephen Green would like to make uh, some remarks. Uh, he is the founder of the White uh, Ribbon uh, UK and the co-founder of Male uh, Challenging Sexism. Mr. Green, I, am, I really hope that you are with us. Okay, good. And uh, now, unfortunately, I can give you only three, maximum four minutes. Thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, can you request the floor again? Sorry, technicalities are always challenging us. So, could you do that? I don't know, it's very difficult because I'm talking to somebody that I don't know, but uh, any chance? Cool. Okay, sure. Okay, then uh, honestly speaking, yes, uh, let's leave the opportunity that he might join and uh, I kindly ask uh, uh, Petra Bayer uh, to make uh, her comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really a question to all the three. Um, there are many movements or many approaches that urge for equality of, of genders. Um, but I think what distinguishes feminism from all the others is that feminism really also has um, or, or urges or, or has the, the claim to really change structural patterns, society structures. Um, and I want to share a very uh, little quote from our former minister, from our first minister of, for women affairs in Austria, Johanna Donal. Um, she said, I think it's time to remember the vision of feminism is not a female future, it is a human future. Without role constraints, without power and violence relation, without male bonding and femininity mania. And so my question is to all of you, is it, is it possible to, to reach a society without gender-based violence, without also urging for feminism? Thank you very much for your questions, and as I was instructed, we have less time than I thought, but I really would like to give the chance for one more comment. Marina Baldina, who has been just elected uh, uh, our great uh, uh, co uh, chair, uh, Baldina, uh, from Ukraine, and of course, our heart are really very much uh, with you. And sure. Thank you, dear colleagues. Say me, please, if you hear me. Yes. Yes, sorry, I can't use my uh, camera now because uh, uh, missile, um, like not missiles, uh, but uh, sirens uh, uh, is is uh, here in the place where I am. So uh, I want first of all to thank you, Ms. Zita, Ms. Petra, uh, for this uh, uh, very uh, very actual and extremely important discussion. I want to share with you like uh, two cases from Ukraine. Uh, first of them uh, 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 is a successful one. Uh, when about eight years ago, uh, we started to reform police system and uh, uh, the majority of police officers at that time were men. And we started with training to teach uh, like uh, them uh, new generation of police officers, I should say, uh, what gender bias, uh, bias violence mean and how to avoid it, how to behave if it happened. Later, they were taught with like special protocols, how to communicate with victims, how to measure different uh, uh, cases of domestic violence, etc. And as a result, law enforcement officers there's uh, in Ukraine now are qualified enough enough to react uh, uh, 
I should say, in right way uh, on the co uh, uh, cases of domestic violence. And um, uh, furthermore, they are enforced guarantees like security during LGBT pride in Ukraine, and for many years it uh, has been absolutely safe. But what we have now, and uh, this is like another great challenge because of war, because of Russian soldiers who in the most brutal way raped women, uh, even 78 years old woman uh, was raped uh, and uh, these soldiers, they raped children, boys and girls. So it was group sexual violences in Ukraine. Uh, we have never seen such cruelty and this is like the real case how men and boys who serve in the army conduct such crimes and we need to think how to stop it and how to rehabilitate victims and witnesses. Uh, so we created police mobile groups uh, who work together with uh, psychologists in the occupied territories, but it is extremely difficult to give uh, a real appropriate help to these people experience raping and tortures. So maybe this is like a, a, an ask to the to our network of women against violence, to women in pace, to organize such special discussions about the ways how in effective way forbid raping as military tool, how to create universal uh, uh, tools, mechanisms uh, to help victims uh, because we never know who can be like next to raped uh, by uh, Russian soldiers. And these sexual violences, uh, I should say, they take a new measure in the contemporary world because of this uh, war uh, on other territory. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much and congratulations for your re-elections as uh, subcommittee chair on gender equality. And uh, if you allow me that uh, there is a question from our dear uh, Secretary General, so I think uh, if you could be very telegraphic. Thank you very much, Despina. Thank you, Zita. Well, it has been so interesting to hear uh, all three speakers, but I have to say I was impressed by the male um, a participant, and I would like to address in particular the issue of sexist attitude by men, boys and men, towards women, acceding to politics, uh, empowered women, or women who try to, to be empowered. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, actually now we have, uh, and of course, uh, I, I, at the end, uh, definitely Petra is going to make a, a sum up. Uh, I leave it up to her. Uh, very short, as unfortunately we have a bit less time. But I just would like to ask uh, our uh, dear three guests uh, uh, who just would like to uh, reply on, on this uh, uh, pretty important uh, uh, question. So I don't know who would like to, to, to start. Can you help me who is going to the first who has the floor? Because I don't have the technique in front of me. Anyway, okay, so let's go in order with Lauro. So then we go in order, Lauro. Could you push the button request and then speak, please? Yeah, hi. Thank you very much for the for the questions. For the sake of time, maybe I will address one. Um, the last one from the Secretary General, which connects also, I think, to the point that uh, Petra Bayer shared about uh, the need for kind of structural changes to eradicate gender-based violence and to promote gender equality. And uh, in terms of uh, um, the sexist attitudes also in the, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the political field uh, when it comes to women's participation, uh, I just wanted to flag uh, an initiative and a resource that may be of interest. That is so often the work of men and boys targets uh, the most uh, uh, underprivileged groups. Uh, and so rarely it targets also the men in positions of power and both are essentially needed. Um, and so the National Democratic Institute in the US with the European University Institute in, uh, um, in Europe has uh, um, launched a new collaboration to work specifically with men uh, in political environments to think about the ways, for instance, parties approach the issue of gender equality and how they talk about it uh, in order to favor women's political participation. So that's something also that's available, publicly available 
and it's uh, it's something that again goes really at addressing the structural factors beyond just working with the individual men. I'll stop here and leave the room to the other speakers. Uh, thank you very very much. I really appreciate that you kept the one minute, and then uh, our second uh, great speaker. Uh, uh, Ms. Teresa Schweiger, so if you could make your comments short. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to address um, also Petra Bayer's comment and the sexist attitude, but I think it's all interlinked. We at Men Engage Europe, um, uh, we support a system change because we are a feminist network and we are very aware that um, it is not enough to work with the individual. It is, um, the burden is, is too much. Um, and the success is, is, is not great. However, from my experience working with a lot of um, boys uh, until the age of 18, uh, the first step is really to make them aware that they have sexist attitudes. This is one of the first steps because the typical uh, gender stereotype for a boy, sometimes it is to be sexist in order to be a boy. And they're sometimes not even aware of the, the harm that is caused by um, this stereotype or this attitude. So I, we believe that by changing also this attitude, um, it can lead to a system change, but it is um, uh, hard work and it's not done um, quickly. This is my experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm also happy to learn from you. And uh, uh, last, uh, Mr. Iablonka, you have one minute and then I give the floor for our excellent rapporteur. Something that uh, the, the 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 crux uh, for me to uh, uh, fight against uh, gender-based violence is how to uh, provide new uh, laws uh, to uh, uh, prevent um, men from harming women, but also how to provide uh, new rules. Uh, and I think that uh, we should uh, broaden the reflection and not only. Uh, focus on um, uh, violence, but also on the sexist uh, attitudes. For example, uh, we can, what I would like to say to my fellow men is that they should check their own behavior in daily life so that it matches with the women's uh, rights. For example, we can imagine a kind of ethics of uh, complimenting in the workplace. Is it appropriate for a manager to compliment a female employee once a day on her dress? Of course, no. But uh, th this has to take place into a more uh, a broader uh, reflection on uh, uh, new uh, rules between men and women. Thank you. One minute, Chris Green. Okay, yes, uh, actually, uh, sorry, Petra, as we understand that uh, Ms. Christine Green is here, and uh, I feel like Winnie the Pooh, honey and milk. So I'm so thankful that you are here, but please make sure that you can make it. Thank you. Hello, I am here and hopefully everybody can hear me now. I am very sorry that we had technical issues before. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on the Council of Europe task force some 16 years ago. And I was thrilled that um, originally Petra Steinen talked about uh, Article 12.4 because it was the first thing I was going to mention. And I think it's up to parliamentarians to hold their parliaments accountable um, that parties shall use all necessary means to encourage all, especially men and boys, to contribute actively to preventing all forms of violence. And I've had many years trying to do this. Uh, White Ribbon Campaign started to do this and we worked through sport and music and got a lot, of, we got up to 60,000 people to sign a pledge. However, that was, not, that was mass engagement, but not mass action. And so I now work with an organization called Male Allies Challenging Sexism to move from caring enough to talk about things to caring enough to take action. And we take action all the time on a personal level, on an institutional level, and also with women's organizations. Finally, we have to ask women what they want, listen to what they say, and then take action, and then go around and do it all again. Ask them again, was that the right thing to do? Listen to what they say, 
and take action again. And I would urge all men, just do it. Don't be silent. Silence is not an option. Thank you very much. Thank you very much that you could make it very short. I really appreciate it. But of course, all of our great uh, speakers has the chance to, to contact uh, directly our excellent reporter. So, Petra, the floor is yours. And, uh, three minutes as I was guided by our yeah. dear president. I will uh, use one minute. Um, thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, Elodie uh, Fisher, the excellent uh, support friend from the Secretariat and I have been taking notes. A few comments. I think you all know the saying equal rights for others does not mean less rights for you. It's not a pie. And I wish every single man would have this on the mirror in the morning shaving or whatever they do in the morning, getting ready. Because equality is not a pie. And I think this has to be addressed. I feel that many of my male colleagues feel that they are losing when more women are coming into politics. And maybe that's one of the underlying reasons for the sexism. I don't know, I'm not a psychologist. Actually, there is a very interesting study by Franz de Waal who is the expert on primates, on chimpanzees and bonobos. And, uh, bonobos. and they, the study has been misunderstood according to him because this is where the alpha male myth comes from. Because he says the alpha male is not only one the, on the dominant male in the, in, the, in the tribe or in the group, it's also the caring, structuring person in the group. So I think, and this is what I really take from the book of Mr. Jablonka, that mindful new types of masculinity enable men to be more caring and sharing and that will make them win. So we will have more pies altogether and the pie indeed is called shared humanity and I hope that uh, my report and the recommendations and the resolution will also help the male colleagues here in this organization to see that more equality and less sexism is good for everybody in this building and for everybody in the parliaments and for the people we are trying to serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we should have a big clap hands for her because it's uh, <laughs> my great uh, uh, Mr. Stein. And of course, I just would like to thank for you all this very inspiring and stimulating discussion. And now, of course, uh, we cannot finish our meeting without our chairperson uh, to do the final. So thank you very much. It was a challenge for you and us. Thank you, Zita, and give a hand to Zita as well. Thank you for coordinating this very interesting and very important hearing uh, on which uh, we look fo forward to your future work on the report, uh, Petra. Um, there's a lot to say, but a little time. So uh, just sort of ending up this committee meeting. Now